thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a really great turnout. This is a great space, great space to speak in. Um, I know that we're talking tangible tonight, um, but you know, like my mom always told me, you just got to be difficult. Um, so about a third of the presentation is going to deal with the tangible. And about two thirds is going to deal a little bit more with the intangible. And the reason I do this is because over the past four or five years, we have seen significant shifts and changes in the product design and industrial design community. And I will get to the reasons why and why the intangible is becoming more important for the tangible. But there's a couple things that I'm going to talk specifically about, and that's a couple of skills that are necessary as designers and we are seeing come to the forefront more and more, especially for young designers to know and to be good at. And then also the second half of that is our relationship to technology as well, which can sometimes be concrete and can sometimes be a little more amorphous. As was mentioned, I work for Whipsaw. Whipsaw is a globally recognized design and engineering consultancy. We have offices here in San Francisco as well as uh, down in San Jose. Whipsaw uh, was formed in 1999. We really cut our teeth with the sort of big silicon companies in the early, I'm sorry, late 90s and the early 2000s. The Cisco's, the Intel's, lots of consumer electronics. In the past 10 years or so, our work has really broken off and segmented into many different market silos. We do massive amounts of work in very, very, very different areas. Everything from sports science equipment, wearables, robotics, um, we'll get into housewares. Tons of IoT, as everyone here can probably well imagine. We get into a lot of scientific instrumentation, medical equipment, class two, class three. As I was mentioning to this gentleman here right before I came up, Whipsaw really is a great playground if you are interested in a lot of different things. If you're a channel flipper, if your attention span is like super short, a consultancy like Whipsaw is great to work in because if you don't like something, just wait a couple hours and you're gonna be working on something different. We literally have designers and engineers that are working on two or three different projects during the course of one day. They may have to ship from a children's product to a high NA DNA sequencing machine in the same day. It really gives you the ability to kind of live the learning channel on a daily basis. We may be asked to do an iconic new design for a household recognized name like Brita and develop a product that hundreds of thousands of people are gonna use during the course of their lifetime. We may be approached by a globally recognized sports company like Nike to bring an engineer a product that had just been a concept or a sketch on somebody's desk or multiple design team's desk, as was the case with the fuel band, and they just couldn't quite get it right to the point of where it could be made. And then we get asked, can you make this concept viable? Can you make this something that we can repeatedly make durably for hundreds of thousands of people? We may get asked to take a six foot robot, which will be journeying out into the aisles of Walmart and design it so that it's socially acceptable and yet engineered to do its job at a really high level. And there's a lot of interesting psychological aspects that go to developing a design for a robot which is gonna go out into public. First tests of this, sending it up and down aisles in public, what do you think one of the things that happen? Little kids, run towards it. Adults, run away from it. <laughs> what do the little kids wanna do? They wanna ride it like a pony. <laughs> we may get asked by local startups like Exobionics to take equipment and technology that can have a super meaningful impact on people's lives, like an exoskeleton that helps partially or fully paralyzed people walk and envision the future and be able to tell a story for that product. And the ability to see some of this technology in person, I will tell you right now, 
I'm pretty, pretty tainted at this point in my career from what I've seen as far as material goods, but the chance to see people that have been paralyzed since they're 18, 19, a gentleman from a car accident walk again on his own, it's pretty crazy and it gives you goosebumps. We may be asked by startups that are developing cutting edge science that it took me about six months of their explanations before I even started to understand it. It was like swatting gnats at first, you know, it was just like way over my head. Working with a team of people that collect degrees like baseball cards and when they approached us and said, hey, we're integrating live neurons with a microchip so that the neurons can detect anything that maybe a dog could smell or sense in the air. Right, okay, it's gonna take me a long time to get this. But finally we get it and to be able to visualize it and then help them tell a story to their potential investors, okay? Potential investors, who's gonna be interested in this? Safety, security, okay? If there's sort of chemicals in the air that were made to develop bombs, the neurons can detect that. You can modify the DNA so that it can detect that. But in order for the company to get more funding, they have to be able to tell it into a way that the audience that they're talking to, CEOs, you know, presidents, marketing officers of large corporations can get it. And we have to visualize this for them. I'm gonna take a moment real quick to talk about how we got to where we are right now as an industrial design community. Of course, the idea of industrial design and mass production didn't start really with the invention of machinery. It was before then, in the 1700s and the 1800s in Europe, when they started having factories, which just included a lot of craftsmen shoehorned into the same place, working off of patterns. But then, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, you got the invention of machinery, and then in the 1930s, you got the Bauhaus in Germany and eventually the new Bauhaus here in the States, in Chicago. And that really began the philosophy of we are going to design these products specifically before they touch manufacturing, but we're gonna keep in mind the efficiency to develop them for mass production. And then what happened after that is that those clicks that developed around the world at different academic institutions, they spread out into consultancies. And then in the 70s and 80s, those consultancies got bigger. And then in the 90s, in the early 2000s, you sort of saw the invention or the advent of the rock star designers, the individual personalities, the faces of firms. And then recently that's been tamped down a little bit as large corporations, your Amazons, your Googles, they develop all of the talent and bring it in house rather than going out to specialized consultancies. And so <clears throat> where are we at right now then? If any of you are familiar with John Maida, you know that every year he publishes a design and tech report. And basically it's a state of the union. Where are we at right now as designers? Where's the profession going? You can see I've highlighted <clears throat> over here on the right hand side, as far as emerging trends, AI and machine learning, okay? Many of you probably mm, maybe have brushed it, AI, machine learning, or you've heard about it. You know that at this point, mm, some of it's just fairy tale, some of it's really speeding up very quick. But this sort of technology is something that we as a whipsaw and a design company are very aware of right now and we're keeping an eye on. Not only the products that our clients are bringing in, a lot of our clients are either beginning to incorporate machine learning, deep learning, AI technology, or they're looking at it. The second half of this is <clears throat> the skills needed, at least in the opinion of John and his report, for the successful designer in the future. The adaptability to tech and social change and number two, empathy. And I know empathy is kind of this little bit of a dirty word right now. It's kind of like, yeah, I love you, I hate you, take me, I'm yours. But <clears throat> it's really important from the standpoint of when we talk about empathy as designers, we're not always talking about empathy for the end user. We're talking about empathy for the people 
that we're working with as a team. Because the teams are becoming more and more diverse and it's becoming more and more global. And I think this is extremely undervalued and understated about empathy right now. There's a very well-known designer here in San Francisco that recently said, empathy is bullshit. And okay, it's kind of like saying love is bullshit. It's hard to pin down, so you know what? I'm just gonna take the easier route and call it bullshit. But the thing is, is that with the teams and the projects that we've seen and I've seen in my career, the lack of empathy for the other people on the team is one of the major reasons projects fail. <clears throat> How we create things as cultures, as societies, as human beings right now, is changing at a breakneck pace, okay? And it's not just how we make things. It's not just going from a manual craftsman <clears throat> line of workers that are slaving away to a more automated approach to fully robotic automated approaches. It's also the way that the people and the users in the world adapts things. It took 50 years for electricity to have 50 million users. It took 19 days for 50 million users for Pokemon Go. That is unbelievable, okay? That means that as designers, as creators, you do not have the time or the luxury anymore to sit and go, oh, <clears throat> we're just gonna send this over to Jed, our neighbor, for a while and let him play with it and just see what happens over the next couple of years and then uh, we'll just rev on it and rev on it and it'll be great, we'll just throw a party. It doesn't happen like that anymore. It has to be optimized and perfected before it gets sent out. Unless you're Google. I'm sorry if anybody's from Google. <laughs> if you're from Google, you just release a beta and just keep calling it beta and beta and beta and we'll just keep making changes on it, right? But things really need to be thought out and well thought out and crafted entirely before they're released at this point. We also see a major shift in business models and then also how new things are created and then released into the wild, as we would call it. Historically, for human cultures, there was a patronage system. So if any of you have sort of studied the Renaissance, you know that the Renaissance was funded in part by very wealthy families, families like the Medicis, who would put a lot of money into individual artists, and they would commission the creation. And then that would be released then to the audience. Now the audience is funding the creation. And it's turned everything up on, just upside down. Totally on its head at this point. Because they're one in the same. What used to be the design of things, people slaving away over the smallest aesthetic physical detail, now has become a design of experiences. Why? A lot of it has to do with what you were all, many of you, holding in your hand right now. A telephone, okay? And what phones have become right now. It's a technological marvel which we overvalue to a certain extent. If you had Alexander Graham Bell and brought him in here and said, hey, look, this is a new version of a phone. It lights up, it takes pictures, great. He's got a great time, he's doing selfies, he's everything. And then he leaves, he's like, well, I wanted to light my candle too. And he's like, well, I can't do that. Well, okay. Well, I'm gonna take it back with me, and then tomorrow I'm gonna wake up, it's gonna work. Well, no, actually it'll die before then. Huh. So we actually overvalue the design a little bit. And then to that point as well, you see that there's an entire experience now around a product. Think about how you engage or see a product for the first time right now. There's many different avenues. It's not just going into a Best Buy, and this is the first time I've seen it. It's reviews on Amazon, it's blog posts, it's Medium, I've heard about it through this, it's through Twitter. So the companies and the people designing the product now have to think about that entire experience from beginning to end. And because of these things, isolated innovation is dying. Those clicks of schools, the thinking, it's becoming outmoded and outdated because it's getting beat by open source thinking global thinking. And I think that this is something that as we progress into the future is eventually gonna come to bite Apple in the ass a little bit. They have a very close culture with some extremely, extremely talented individuals. But eventually, and I think you sort of see it right now, 
When was the last time they really developed something on their own which was brand new? They're great at optimizing something that's already out there. But how long can you keep up like that? <clears throat> so where we're at right now is the really revolutionary creation has become a social activity. And because it's a social activity, that means it's now a democratic process, which sounds wonderful. It sounds great. And in some ways it is. The regular Jane or Joe off the street 10 years ago that may not have ever even had the chance to see their idea come to fruition, they now have avenues for that to happen. But there is a huge downside to this. When you democratize something, just like societies, just like governments, design has a downside to this too. And that means really that there are people that have the ability and the right to say that their opinion, and sometimes an uneducated and uninformed opinion, is worth just as much as your expertise. Just as much as 20 years of experience. Just as much as 30 years of experience. We've had entrepreneurs come in and say, well, I read the Steve Jobs book last week. As if, all right, all of a sudden, it just makes up for all of that time. And now what we have to do as consultants is very oh so gently, because we're dealing with some extremely smart people, physicians, doctors, people have had massive amounts of success in other fields. And we need to just so carefully uneducate them and re-educate them without informing them or telling them that they're wrong about anything. And all of these people that we're seeing right now, this is the reason why empathy is so important, is because we have to speak a different language to all of these people. And the reason it's important is because we have a lot of meaningful ideas which are coming in. And you don't want to have to fight every single battle, okay? We have to understand the startup dreamers that are coming in. We have to understand the armchair experts and let them win a few battles. We have to understand the stressed out workers. I've had clients cry, literally cry on my shoulder before after meetings because they were such assholes in the meetings. I stop them afterwards and like, what's going on? And then it starts with the husband or the wife and it just goes downhill from there. <laughs> but this is part of developing that relationship with the team and having empathy for people in the team. The prima donna designers, okay, like we all know them, I, you know, you, there may be some right here, and kudos to you if you are. <laughs> um, the rock star CEOs, okay, they come in, they founded the company, it's my fourth, this is my fifth company, it's my sixth, what happened to the other ones? You don't want to know, but I failed fast, and I learned fast, and then because I failed so fast, now I've made it into this badge because we've done so much failing, I've turned it into something that's great. <laughs> the point is, is we have to work with a lot of different people now because the design process has been democratized so much. And what has happened is empathy has the ability to make us basically creative super connectors. And this is going to become more important because that innovation that I was talking about, that real innovation, capital I innovation, not the drop term innovation that you hear everybody use, but real, true invention, revolutionary ideas are going to come from teams of people from all different walks of life and all different professions. <clears throat> it will allow you to anticipate. This is a very big thing in meetings. Okay, when you're talking to new customers, when you're talking to new clients as a designer, you need to be able to hear what is not being said just as much as what is being said. Mediation, okay, working out problems within the team. Negotiating, this is very big as well. There are a lot of people that really undervalue the, <clears throat> the ability of design to help a product, okay? And you need to be able to know how to speak the language of C-level execs, marketing people, the people that actually sign the checks and sleep with a lot of money underneath their mattress in order to persuade them that this is really valuable, okay? And not just to you and your bottom line, it is also really valuable to our culture and society moving forward. Illumination, okay? It also 
helps you see the problems two or three steps ahead. You know, we talk a lot right now about these new developing technologies, AR, VR, autonomous vehicles. What we need to be doing as designers is speculating two or three steps ahead. What could these things do down the road, not just right now? And finally, the most important thing is communication. In my career, I would have to say that probably nine out of 10 of the programs that I have seen or witnessed, either worked on inside or witnessed from afar, the reason that they fail is not because of the work, it's because of communication. So the future, and where are we going at this point? There's a new creative process that we're seeing evolve, okay? And it really is more of an open social network. There was a time in the early 2000s where you heard the word turnkey dropped, okay? And there's a reason why it's not used anymore. It's because it didn't work. Places stretched themselves way too thin to try to do at a me mediocre level a lot of different things. What we're going towards right now is more of an open global bazaar, okay? It's interconnected companies that have forged relationships not based on contracts or financial kickbacks or exclusive deals, but simply because of the fact that their teams work and fit really well together. And on top of that, that fit, that empathetic thinking as far as working together with these teams to develop these meaningful solutions will now be augmented by technology. <clears throat> And when I talk about these new ecosystems, for instance, Whipsaw, some of the partners, some of the places that we deal with, there's communities like Hardware Massive here in San Francisco. It basically brings together like-minded hardware design individuals, gives them information, gives them places to go. These are the people that you wanna to talk to. Again, we go back to that sort of global bazaar. And when you walk in, you say, I'm gonna need a lot of different things. Can you help me out? And there's a concierge there whether it be somebody like myself and at Whipsaw, somebody in at Hardware Massive, and they say, oh, you need to talk to this person. And we all know one another, and we all vet one another because we all need to provide level A services. Other places like Dragon Innovation, very similar. Helping people get into the manufacturing process, which can be mind-numbingly complex, and give them more of a soft landing. Companies like Intops, which we partner with as a contract manufacturer out of Korea. Companies like Intops do A-level work. If you have a Samsung phone in your hand right now, they manufactured it. But then they also work with startups as well. This is a very important cog in that bazaar because at some point, when you're all sitting around the table and you say, we got a great idea, we got this great idea, let's all work on it, let's all work on it, and then finally it's like, all right, who's got the money? <laughs> right now, it's the global contract manufacturers. It's not necessarily the large corporations anymore. Global contract manufacturers are going to be behind a lot of the revolutionary ideas and products that you will see in the future. <clears throat> and we talk about new technologies, okay? Some of you may be familiar with Fictiv or Fathom. They're developing new rapid prototyping and 3D printing technologies that allow people to visualize, evaluate, and test their ideas much more quickly or AI capabilities. Adobe, trying out Sensei, which is an AI backbone for a lot of their programs. Now, a lot of designers are a little scared, a little concerned, oh, AI, AI. Relax, okay, it's not there, it's not quite there yet. AI is really good at pulling in a lot of data and making sense of that data. But creating without context is not something that AI does well. But this is the thing that I will say that the creative community needs to embrace AI for this reason. It will be able to augment and help us with a lot of the everyday sort of mundane tasks of design and will allow us to concentrate on more impactful and meaningful ideas. Autodesk also here in the city with Dreamcatcher, a program which has some machine learning capabilities which allows you to set presets and then develop ideas and designs <coughs> through machine learning on its own generative design, if you're not familiar with what it's called. And it has a <coughs> sort of distinct aesthetic, which a lot of people really love, and then some other people not so sure about. 
But the idea of designing and developing products, I guarantee you in your lifetime, you will buy a product that has been fully designed by machine intelligence. And the idea is, hmm, will they tell you it's been fully designed and created and thought from the ground up by a machine, or will they not tell you? I would say that some people here will even buy fine art, which has been created fully by a machine. So these two things paired together, new technologies and empathy. What is it going to allow us to do? First, is connect the people, okay? This is really, really important because again, as we've seen, the global mind, the mind of many people, is able to think and create things much faster than the isolated individuals. And then that technology is gonna help us to create the unimagined, okay? And that is again going two or three steps ahead. There's a lot of research that says, okay, this is what people need, but that's the difference between good design and great design, okay? Good design answers the questions that people are asking that everyone already knows the answer to. Great design helps people and meets desires that people don't even know that they have. This is the unrealized dreams that people are starting to get to. And the combination of that empathetic thinking and that technology will help us create things that help deliver and provide wonder to people. And this is really where we see the field going right now, is in this direction of working maybe less time but creating more meaningful, impactful things that surprise and delight people. Thank you.